Good evening, everyone. I'm Stevenson Palmer, ordained Reverend for Side Church. I'm a chaplain for Side Church, a priest for Side Church. I'm also a preceptor for Side Church. I'm also a preacher for Side Church. I have a doctor in video, doctor in Manitourism, doctor in Ministry, doctor in Physics, all in course. I'm a professor of theology. Happy Valentine's Day! Today, the 14th of February, is of course Valentine's Day, the commercial holiday based on St. Valentine. Last year, I talked about the history of St. Valentine, as well as the history of Valentine's Day and what it means to be of love. With everything that is happening this year, I'll be talking about the love of a Christian, what it means to be of love, and what failing that means, especially for those who call themselves Christians, but have the spirit of anger and the spirit of hatred in them, and do things that make them not of Christ, and make them not of God, for God is love. So to start this off, what is the definition of love? According to Merriam-Webster, love is defined as a feeling of strong or constant affection for a person, motherly, maternal love, fatherly, maternal love, attraction that includes sexual desire, the strong affection felt by people who have a romantic relationship, a declaration of love, you as just a lonely man looking for love, a person you love in a romantic way, a lost love, you never forget your first love. The synonym of love are affection, attachment, devotionness, devotedness, devotion, fondness, passion. With the antonyms abomination, hate, hatred, loathing, rancor. Link in the description, by the way. According to dictionary.com, love is defined as a profound, tender, passion, and affection for another person, a feeling of warm personal attachment or deep affection, as for a parent, child, or friend, sexual passion, or desire. The synonyms of love are tenderness, fondness, predilection, warmth, passion, adoration. The antonyms of love are hatred, dislike, distest, hate. What is the basic definition of love? Love is an intense, deep affection for another person. Love also means to feel this intense affection for someone. Love can also refer to a strong like for something or like something a lot. Love has many other senses, both as a verb and a noun. It is difficult to explain what love is. Love is one of the most intense emotions humans feel in life. It is the opposite of hate. Another incredibly intense emotion. When you would do anything for a specific person, that's usually because you feel love for them. There are many kinds of deep affection you can have for another person, and they all can be described as love. The love you feel for your parents won't be the same love you feel for a close friend or a romantic partner. You can also have a strong emotional bond with an animal such as your dog. That, too, is love. In this sense, love can also be used to mean to really like something or someone. The word lover is used to mean a person who really likes something as in a dog lover or a food lover. Link in the description, by the way. Love is very well defined and has very clear definitions as any. It also has a clear definition of the opposite of love. So what does the Bible say about love? Owe no one anything except to love one another each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to your neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daylight, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. That's Romans chapter 13, verses 18, 8 through 14. version. So chosen by God for this new life of love, Dressed in the wardrobe God picked out for you, compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, discipline, be even-tempered, content with second place, quick to forgive an offense, forgive as quickly and completely as the Master forgave you, and regardless of what else you put on, wear love, it's your all-basic, all-purpose garment. Never be without it. And that's Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. See? Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. 
And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son in the appropriation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we can love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and believe that the love God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fear has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. And then one says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. He who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God who he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. And we actually will be uh, having a very clear definition of that said brother and a little bit later in this. And this is 1 John chapter 7, verse 7 through 21 in the Standard Version. And again, 1 John chapter 7, verse 7 through 21 is Imagine This Day. The Bible has many references of love and clearly defines what is love and what love a Christian must have for others and how that love is expressed. So, what does theology say about love and Christian love? According to Baker's Evangelical Dictionary and Biblical Theology, love is defined as God is love and has demonstrated that love in everything that he does. Paul compares faith, hope, and love and concludes that the greatest of these is love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. God is love, agape. The love theme of the Bible can only be defined by the nature of God. John affirms that God is love, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. God does not merely love, he is love. Everything that God does flows from his love. John emphasizes repeatedly that God the Father loves the Son. John chapter 5, verse 20. John chapter 17, verse 23. John chapter 17, verse 26. And that the Son loves the Father. John chapter 14, verse 31. Because the Father loves the Son, he made his will known to him. Jesus, in turn, demonstrated his love to the Father through his submission and obedience. The theme in the entire Bible is a self-revelation of the God of love. In the Garden of Eden, God commanded that you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. We are not prepared then when God looks for Adam after his sin, calling out, Where are you? God seeks Adam not to put him to death, but to reestablish a relationship with him. God the lover will not allow sin to stand between him and his creature. He personally bridges the gap. <clears throat> that seeking and bridging reaches its pinnacle when God sent his son to the world to rescue sinners and provide them the, with the eternal life. John chapter 3, verse 16, Romans chapter 5, verse 7 through 8, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. John declares, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. God's love is not based on the merit of the recipient. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7 through 8, or Romans chapter 5, verses 7 through 8. Because he is love, God is not willing that any person should perish, but wills that everyone repent and love. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 32. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Love the Lord your God. We are totally incapable of loving either God or others, a condition that must be corrected by God before we can love. The Bible's ways of describing this process and correction are numerous. Circumcision of the heart, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. God's writing his laws in our hearts, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33. God substituting a heart of flesh for a heart of stone, Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19. Being born again by the Spirit, John chapter 3, verse 3. 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 2, removing old clothing and replacing with the new first. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, dying to a sinful life and resurrecting to a new one. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, moving out of the darkness into light. 1 John chapter 2, verse 9, until that happens, we cannot love. God alone is the source of love. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. He pouring out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us, Romans chapter 5, verse 5. God's love then awakens a response in those who accept it. God loves through believers who act as channels for his love. They are branches who must abide in the vine if they are to have that love. And that is key. 
in and of itself. We have to be a love. And of course, we'll be going on a little bit later about those who fail us and what's happening to them spiritually. And, and of course, it is concurrent with events happening here in the U.S. especially. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. We have the assurance that we have passed from death to life because we love others. 1 John chapter 3, verse 14. Once we have received God's love as his children, he expects us to love. In fact, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. Jude urges his readers to keep themselves in God's love. Verse 21. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love of God is a response of the whole of the believer's heart, soul, mind, and strength. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40, Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34, to the whole of God. Jesus serves as a believer's model, John chapter 14, verse 21, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, obedience to God, Deuteronomy chapter 6 through 7, and then verses 7 through 9, and renunciation of the world system, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, are critical elements of our love of God. Our love, however, is easily misdirected. It objects tend to become the creation rather than the creator. It loses sight of the eternal for the temporal. It focuses on the self, often to the exclusion of God and others. We become idolaters, focusing a part or all our love elsewhere. So like Trump supporters, for example. Again, putting a part of our heart towards someone or something is idolatry, whether it is a person or anything else. So, like, all these Christians who became Trump supporters, they fell to idolatry <sighs> and subsequently fell innumerably. We are love breakers more than law breakers. Genesis 22 presents a classic struggle, the conflicting pools of love. Abraham loves Isaac, the son of his old age, the child of God's promise, but God tests his love. For the sake of the love of God, Abraham is willing to sacrifice the son he loves. His response is a greater love. Jesus describes this conflict as hating father and mother in order to love and follow God. Luke chapter 14, verse 26. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love for neighbor is a decision that we make to treat others with respect and concern to put the interests and safety of our neighbors on a level with our own. And of course, uh, narcissists and anti-maskers, anti-vaxxers will not do this. And it's that failing of loving thy neighbor, which of course is a failing of love and subsequently makes them not of God, so makes them not of Christ, makes them not a Christian because it's an absolute failing of this tenet and testament. Which in and of itself, there actually is no, no excuse, really. It demands a practical outworking in everyday life, praising retaining wall around the roof to keep people from falling, Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 8, not taking milestones and pledge, thus denying someone the ability to grind grain in the into flour, Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 6, allowing the poor to glean leftovers from the orchards and fields, Leviticus 19, verses 9 through 12. Our actions illustrate our love. Love for neighbor is love in action, doing something specific and tangible for others. And again, that's our point. When it comes down to our actions and words matter, our actions towards others matter. And you can tell the difference between a Christian and a fallen Christian. How they treat others. Because we as Christians, no matter what, have to do all things out of love. And of course, when it comes to sin, in and of itself, sin is described and defined specifically as not loving your neighbor, as harming others, even unnecessarily, even with negligence. So... In and of itself, there's no excuse, actually. 
we have two choices here of love. So, help others, be mindful of others, compassion or kindness, or do the direct opposite. Call people names, bullying, etc. Treating others how we want to treat them, doing as we wish to others. That in and of itself is <laughs> more than sin in and of itself. And there will be another point later going on in this. <clears throat> the New Testament concept closely parallels that of the Old Testament. John writes, Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. Believers need to share with those in need, whether that need is for food, lodging, clothing, healing, or friendship. Matthew chapter 25, verses 33 to 40. Romans chapter 12, verse 13. The love demonstrated in the parable of the Good Samaritan shows that agape love is not emotional love, but a response to someone who is in need. The command to love others is based on how God has loved us. Since believers have been recipients of love, they must love. Since Christ has laid down his life for us, we must be willing to lay down our lives for our brothers. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. And the definition of our brothers will be again coming up later in this. Many people in Jesus' day believed that a neighbor was a fellow Israelite. When asked to define neighbor, however, Jesus cited the parable of the Good Samaritan, a person who knowingly crossed traditional boundaries to help a wounded Jew, Luke chapter 10, verses 29 through 37. A neighbor is anyone who is in need. Jesus also told his disciples that a neighbor might not even be someone who hates them, curses them, or mistreats them. And they might even be, and that's the point. Yet they must love even enemies. Luke chapter 6, verse 27 through 36 as a witness and a testimony. Again, it comes down to the definition of being a Christian. It comes down to, these days specifically, how they treat others. And this will determine whether they are or they are not. So when you see all these Christians who are malicious, malevolent, spouting hatred, spouting violence, spouting threats for violence, or worse, and actively doing it, they are not of Christ. But they are the opposition of Christ, of course. Because of the spirits of anger and hate and other types of demonic spirits. Giving into the temptation, demonic temptation, demonic suggestion. You know, this is where they lie. <laughs> the Old Testament charge was to love your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus 19.18 but Jesus gave his disciples a new command with a radically different motive. Love each other as I have loved you. John chapter 15 verse 12. Paul affirms that the entire law is summed up in the same command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Galatians chapter 5 verse 14. James sees the command to love one another as the royal law. James chapter 2 verse 8. Love is the motivation for evangelicalism. Christ's love compels us to become ambassadors for Christ with a ministry of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Link in the description, by the way. According to the theological article, What is Love? by Meg Butcher, love agape is defined as agape love is selfless and unconditional. Strong defines it as brotherly love, affection, goodwill, love, benevolence. When we love with this kind of love, we are seeking to give of ourselves. The most extravagant example of this love is a sacrifice Jesus made on the cross for us and the willingness of God to give his one and only Son on our behalf. He seeks nothing from us. Nothing we have to give God would provide him any gains. He simply loves us. But now faith, hope, love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, NASB. The Lord our God, the Father, Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Mark chapter 12, verses 19 through 31 in NIV. Jesus emphatically proclaimed love as the most important command to obey. The four gospel accounts reveal an up-close and personal journey of Christ's love, life on earth. His life fulfilled of the Old Testament and his legacy continues to prepare us for the future by connecting those truths to the New Testament teachings. If we want to learn what love is, Scripture has all the answers. 
I have been crucified with Christ, and no longer who I am who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I know now live is known in flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, and ESB. The Greek word for live and lives in the above verse is zao. Sorry if I'm butchering that, by the way. It means to enjoy real life, living water, having vital power in itself, and exerting the same upon the soul. Strong's. It goes on to further define this type of life as fresh, strong, efficient, active, and powerful. God's agape love, fleshed out for us in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, is alive and active in all those who believe in him. We love by letting it flow back out and through us to others. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. John chapter 15, verse 13. Loving others goes far beyond just being a good person because true love still operates when we don't feel like it. The grace we've been given provides the strength we need to pass it on. Jesus didn't want to go through the pain on the cross, but the love Jesus has for the Father defines his allegiance. He cried in agony in the garden of Gethsemane, yet he obeyed the Father in his duty to save the entirety of the human race. In life there will be quarrels, fights, animosity, manipulation, justification, entitlement, and the slew of other tempting options to embrace. In faith we choose daily to surrender our inclinations so that his love can move through us. It's not something we do, but that he does through us. And here's a quote from C.S. Lewis, which the author provided. Love is not an affectionate feeling, but a steady wish for the loved person's ultimate good as far as it can be obtained. C.S. Lewis, a uh, God in the dark. We do know that Christ is love. Christians should model his kindness, forgiveness, and inclusionary grace, regarding every human being as a creation of God that they are and treating them with the unconditional love of Christ. Which is, of course, very key to being a Christian. And... Many of these Christians who give to Trumpism, Christian nationalism, do not do this. And, of course, we get to observe this in pretty much every conceivable way. By his very character, God is love, and to know him is to extend his love to those around us. However, we must also be careful to walk in his truth, acknowledging that Jesus Christ, the righteous, is appropriation for our sins, and not ours only, but also for those of the whole world. First John chapter 2, verse 1, Dr. Charles Stanley, Life Principles, Bible Nuts. By this all we know that you are my disciples, if you love, have love for one another. John chapter 13, verse 35. Link is a description, by the way. So love, in and of itself, is clearly defined theologically. We as Christians have to be of agape when it comes to being of Christ. We have to love those around us and our enemies as we wish to do us harm with Jesus' infinite love and treat others as we would treat ourselves. Two specific passages come to mind concerning agape, which we as Christians are to follow without exception. Owe no one anything except the love to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to your neighbor, therefore love has a fulfilling of the law. Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. So the love we Christians are supposed to give to others is summed up as, you shall love your neighbor, those around you as yourself. Sin is subsequently defined as doing wrong to those around you in any conceivable way. For love does no wrong to a neighbor. We Christians are of love. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7-8. through eight. God is love, and whoever loves God loves is of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love racists, xenophobes, extremists, Christian nationalists, narcissists, etc., a.k.a. those who have the spirit of hate and those the spirit of anger in them, is not of God, and I have to affirm this as a legally ordained reverend. As we learned in the spiritual enthrallment sermon last week's sermon concerning the Antichrist and Christian nationalism, 
We learn the types of demonic spirits, anger and hate, and learn that the spirits do in fact tempt, suggest individuals to harm others. Outside of temporary possession, a demon cannot make a person do what they don't wish to do. So, when these Christians are malicious and malevolent towards others, and believe that they have to commit violence for their political agendas and their beliefs. Again, that's malicious and malevolence. And there is a multitude of certain types of demons of which they are given into these temptations. And again, they are fallen, absolutely. Because they fail, being of love. And this is why I have to compassion on them, but at the same time, they are to be marked as excommunicated. So they have to be excommunicated. They are cast away. They are lost. And, of course, what we do for those who are lost, those who are fallen, we pray for them, specifically, and try for reconciliation so that they can return. And once they repented, of course, you can't have forgiveness without having repentance, because that is cheap grace, in other words. And once they repent, they can return back to being of the church, of being of the body of Christ. But until such things, they should have to be marked as excommunicated and treated as such, and prayed for repeatedly. There is a clear divide, especially these days, between those who are of Christ and those who are not of Christ, slash fallen. Those who are of hatred ang and anger are separated from God due to those emotions. Narcissism is a love of self over others, which of course is equivalent to Satanism. Hatred for others is fallenness, for it is anti-love. Again, many Christians these days are fallen due to following the false doctrine of once saved, always saved. Believing that they can do all that they wish, narcissism, especially to those they dislike, race, gender, orientation, etc. And by both believing so and doing so, they fell, and Lucifer uses those with hatred in their hearts to do unspeakable evils. The narcissism does make them have a lack of empathy for others and thus not caring what happens to their neighbors, so negligence in their actions. And of course, that dooms them to come in a different way. And we'll go into that a little bit later as well. Not caring what happens to their neighbors, especially what their own actions can and will do, unintentionally or not. Narcissism is equivalent to Satanism in the fact that the person believes they can do all they wish, that no one has authority over them, and that they are the gods of their own lives. And we're witnessing this more and more with so many Christians these days, especially for their desires for full liberty and forgetting that in Romans chapter 13 they actually have to submit to authority. So they're crying for, for their liberty. But in and of itself, their liberty is that they can do all they wish and they believe that. And that in and of itself is Again, purely not of Christ, it's unconstrained human nature, it's fallen us, so, so much demonic temptations. So here's an excerpt from an excerpt that explains the demonic, the antics of Satan and his fallen army, angels, which relates to narcissism, which can be considered a form of Satanism, and of course it relates especially to those who cry for full liberty these days. Generally, one distinguishes between a personal Satanism or occultism and an impersonal or rational Satanism. The first recognizes the personal nature of Satan, the followers entreat, adore, and honor him as a god. The second, the impersonal rationalist, does not believe in Satan's personal nature, that is, in the metaphysical sense. Rather, they see him as a cosmic energy that is present in each man and in the world, and that when called upon, will energize in all its power to carry out the most absurd and atrocious perversions, always connect them in his Roderick rights. What is their objective? Satanists should wish to develop this pray to pray form of devotion through a diffusion of theory and practice of three basic principles. You can do all that you wish, no one has the right to command you, and you are the god of yourself. 
So, aka, you can do all you wish. No one has authority over you. You are the god of yourself. You don't have to do that for your ass. And when it comes to all these people crying for freedom, for liberty, all, again, all these Christian nationalists. Again, that's the... Uh, all these, uh... Demonic theologies they've been preached to, indoctrinated in. The first principle intends to confer full liberty to the adherent in everything he wishes to do without limits. And again, that is key. Because when it comes down to it, their full of belief is because God gave them ability to do as they wish, because in and of itself. But that, of course, is incorrect. Because while we have free will, God created a lot of consequences because of that fall. And in and of itself, there are limits to what we can do. And again, a man of Christians believe we because they have this free will, and that they can do all they wish without limits. And they can do all they wish to others without limits. And again, that is pure and utter fallenness. And in and of itself, the principles of Satanism are all right there. The second is released from the principle of authority, that is, from any obligation to obey parents, the church, the state, whoever places restrictions in the name of, for the common good. And in itself, when it comes down to this pandemic, they're trying to do a lot of things for the common good, and of course, all these people who want their full liberty, playing right in the hands of Lucifer at the end of the day. Because they appear actually going for a much more orthodox approach, or a Catholic approach to this. <clears throat> and if you're trying to go from an exorcist perspective on this, then yeah, they're playing right into Lucifer's hand. Pure and simple. Really. The third denies all the truth that comes directly from God, paradise, inferno, purgatory, judgment, the Ten Commandments, the precepts of the church, Mary, and so forth. In appearance, these principles are seductive, especially in younger people, because they delude them into thinking that life is a beautiful holiday in a magic land of playthings, where everything is permitted and your eye does not recognize any limits regarding pleasure and enjoyment. It is my conviction, as well as my heartfelt advice to all parents, that in order to help their children to stay in this perspective with all its destructive nature, it is necessary to educate them from an early age to cultivate life as faith through prayer, through the Mass, and through association with various Catholic loose clubs, and other similar organizations, it is absolutely necessary to give them a sense of God and the awareness of the existence of sin and the devil, the temptor who wishes to lead us to a separation from God and therefore to death. These young people then, when they have become older, will probably have developed the right attitudes towards these sects and satanic practices. I am aware that it involves a difficult form of education, but let us always remember that because of the total absence of beautiful and good ideals, young people today are more exposed to these dangers. When faith disappears, one abandons himself to superstition and occultism. Link in the description, by the way. But on that note, though, when it comes to the Christian nationalists, and in and of itself, they are exposed to all those dangers. We see these fallen Christians these days as they are, the Christian nationalists, racist xenophobes, and of course, especially anti-vaxxers, the straight-up narcissism. I've witnessed personally as those who were strong Christians spouting support for antichrist movements slash Christian nationalism, such as the anti-vaxxer freedom movement in Canada as of recent. Again, that lack of love for their neighbors and that belief that their personal freedom comes at the expense of others' lives, their free will. Again, that lack of empathy for others, that lack of love for others, it is pure antichrist in doctrine and in origin. And as of recent, uh, one of my friends who's like a brother to me has ended up, who I believe was a strong Christian, ended up spouting support for the freedom movement. <clears throat> it's like watching all these good Christians 
falling into Lucifer's grasp because they got indoctrinated for the fear mongering, the hate mongering. And of course, uh, watching how they treat others and watching that fallenness continue. And I will get more into this as I go along. Because, yeah, this video is subsequently a slightly bit different than my actual written form. And yes, I like to do a little more lengthy to be on point because I have to add context to my words. And the thought process therein. I mean, outside of the pure theological standpoint. To be fair, though, that unrepentantness concerning their particular idolatry, Trumpism, again, is the antithesis to being of Christ, being of love and peace, and subsequently understanding that they are fallen and to consider them excommunicated, cast out of Christianity until they repent and atone, again, is a necessary first step. The second step is, of course, to pray that God heals your minds, bodies, and souls after you repent and before it's too late, for God will change them. It may take hours, days, weeks, months, or even years. The third step is to hold them legally accountable as they try to harm others, slash they harm others. Yeah, I'm going to read this real quick, because, again, when it comes to the Christian nationalists, and they believe in a lot of violence, unfortunately, to make their political goals or the Christian beliefs a reality and they fail very specific Christian principles and they no longer are of Christ. They fail Christ's tenets and testaments. And this is why they have to be excommunicated or you should personally consider them excommunicated. Treat them as fallen and try to save them. So, blessed are the peacekeepers for they shall be called children of God. The followers of Jesus have been called to peace. When he called them, they found their peace, but he, he, for he is their peace. But now they are told that they must not only have peace, but make it. And to that end, they renounce all violence and tumult. In the cause of Christ, nothing is to be gained by such methods. His kingdom is the one of peace, and the mutual greeting of his flock is a greeting of peace. His disciples keep the peace by choosing to endure suffering themselves, rather than inflict it on others. They maintain fellowship where others would break it off. They renounce all self-assertion. They quietly suffer in the face of the hatred and wrong. In doing so, they overcome evil with good and establish the peace of the God in the midst of a world of war and hate. But nowhere will that peace be more manifest than where they meet the wicked in peace and are ready to suffer at their hands. The peacemakers will carry the cross for their Lord, for it was on the cross that peace was made. Now that they are partners in Christ's work of reconciliation, they are called the sons of God, as he is the Son of God. And this is, of course, from the Beatitudes chapter from Dietrich Bonhoeffer's The Cost of Discipleship. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer is on point. As we, as Christians, are peacemakers, and we are peace and love. So anyone who tries to use violence for their religious beliefs as Christians. Again, Lucifer uses those with hatred in the hearts to do unspeakable evils. And the, the spirits of hatred and the spirit of anger, those type of demonic spirits, entice people and tempt people and, of course, their demonic suggestions to these Christians to make him do these things, and when they do these things, they are fallen. And again, we as Christians have are very specific when it comes to we have to do very specific things. We have to be of love and we have to be of peace. There is zero exception to this. Because repeated failures in this this fallenness, pure and simple. And this is why all these people are excommunicated. Or not of Christ anymore. And that's the um, understanding of the observation based on what they do to others. And as stated earlier in the theological and the biblical, what we do matters. So with all the change we've witnessed and so many Christians becoming hateful, grateful, 
spouting threats of violence, calls for civil war if their Messiah, Trump, isn't their king, and others, as well as actually following through and harming others, following false doctrines such as once saved, always saved, again, isn't of Christ. So concerning the spiritual evils they contracted, let's look at the Exodus explains the demonic, the antics of Satan's army of fallen angels. <coughs> We have spoken of evil spells, possession, vexation, obsession, and infestation. Now the question arises, why does God permit evil? First, it is necessary to make clear that God, being infinite love, does not wish evil. He simply permits it. He simply permits it. Because he created men and angels as free creatures, simply put, men are free to choose whether they wish to live for God or against him, and therefore to opt for heaven or for hell. We must recognize that God has made everything to make man happy, and in accordance with this plan, God asks man to obey the laws that he has established, but God has also given man the ability to refuse this truth. This is the situation in which we are placed. Another capable means of contracting spiritual evils that in some cases can be particularly weighty is perseverance in sin and vice, that is, living a life stubbornly and with conviction that is contrary to love. Link in the description, by the way. But yeah, contrary to love. So, all these Christians that we notice that are no longer of Christ, all the hatred that they are spouting, all that rage, all that anger and all that violence, and then when they commit all these things, they are living that life contrary to love. So there is a very clear defined be divide between what is of Christ and what is not, and what is a Christian and what is not. Sorry if you hear a dark barking in the background, that's one of my roommates is, unfortunately. So let's continue. Sin is defined as harming others, especially unnecessarily. Again, words and actions do matter. Hatred, xenophobia is contrary to love, and again, as we've learned, spirit of hate, spirit of anger, are types of demons that assault people with temptations, such as demonic suggestion to harm others, them ending up being pawns of Lucifer, which Lucifer uses in abundance knowingly or otherwise, since it is irrevocably proven that Lucifer uses those with hatred in their hearts to do unspeakable evils. We see this with the events of January 6th of last year, as well as Christian nationalism, and of course Trumpism. The threats of violence calls for civil war and actual violence. And in and of itself, uh, a decent amount of Christians still spouting all the xenophobia and hatred, especially Christians that you personally know, or not even I personally know. And the thing is, is, of course, in their personal lives, do they not actually know that, is, that they are being observed critically? Because, again, when it comes down to God uses people in and around you. <coughs> so every person that you meet, every person that you greet, in and of itself, they are the physical manifestation. God took care of human form, and Jesus came. And when it comes down to how you treat others, be wary. Because if you are harming others, the, what you do to the least of these, you do to me. And there you go. In the observances of Christians changing, Listening to their fear-mongering, there is a spirit of fear, incidentally, that is also considered a type of demon, hate-mongering, QAnon conspiracy, or their support of Christian nationalist views slash movements, and their beliefs about others, racist, racist xenophobic grants, and especially about what they wish to do to others, I would have to state in no uncertain terms, and I have to say in no uncertain terms, that the change in people we are witnessing for correct terminology for those who are spiritually enthralled they are experiencing diabolical obsession. What is diabolical obsession, you ask? According to Father Gabriel Amarath, diabolical obsession is defined as 
Diabolical obsessions are disturbances or extreme strong hallucinations that the demon imposes often visibly on the mind of the victim. In these cases, a person is no longer master of their own thoughts. Rather, he is subjected to a powerful force that creates mental activity in him that is repetitive, obsessive, and irresistible. So all these conspiracy theorists, so QAnon Trumpists, etc., Christian nationalists. Here we go, there is a huge list. And I will continue. <clears throat> Such representations of reality, even if foreign to his manner of thinking, become profoundly fixed on his psyche. The objects of these hallucinations can be manifested in visions as voices or as rustlings. They can also appear as monstrous figures, horrifying animals, or devils. In other cases, it may be an impulse to commit suicide or do evil to others. So all these acts and calls for violence and desires for violence against people who are perceived as enemies to their dear leader, to Trump or, and again, in and of itself, they are experiencing diabolical obsessions. The history of cases is so vast that it is impossible to enumerate all the forms of diabolical obsession. Link is in the description, by the way. So, the hero worship, which is considered idolatry, by the way, was the start of diabolical obsession of so many Christians who later became no longer of Christ for idolatry, racism, xenophobia, which all go against every tenet and testament of Christ, especially Majesty Day, concerning racism slash xenophobia. We witnessed in the four years of Trump, and especially during the events of January 6th of last year and after, we see this obsession in QAnon, Trump supporters, and continue to in Trumpism and other forms of Christian nationalism. All that hatred, spouse of anger, violence, etc., there is a spiritual change in people that is purely antichrist, and it is undeniable. And there is an origin. So, as a Christian, again, we have to be of love and we have to be of peace. There is no exception to this. We have to be compassionate, especially for those who are fallen. We have to value others, the lives of others around us. For every human is our brother slash sister. Both the Bible and theology teach us this. The Bible warns against being angry with our brother slash sister, cursing them, and worse, and tells us what must be done in order to not be of separation from God, of which Lucifer seeks for each one of us. For again, he cannot win a war conventionally against God, so he will take as many souls with him. You have heard, as it was said for those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council who never says, you fool, will be held liable to the hell of fire. If you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go, First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 through 26, in the Standard Version. Dietrich Bonhoeffer talks about who is our brother in The Cost of Discipleship. Here are some excerpts from The Cost of Discipleship. And this is actually from chapter 8, or chapter 9, uh, called The Brother. The first law which Jesus commands to his disciples is the one which forbids murder and treats their brother's welfare to their keeping. The brother's life is a divine ordinance, and God alone has a power over life and death. There is no place for the murder among the people of God. The judgment he passes on others falls on the murderer himself. In this context, brother means more than fellow Christian. For the former follower of Jesus, there is, can be no limit as to who is his neighbor, except as his Lord decides. He is forbidden to commit murder under pain of the divine judgment. For him, the brother's life is a boundary which he dare not pass. Even anger is enough to overstep the mark. Still more, the casual angry word raka, and most of all, the deliberate insult of our brother and deliberate insult, indeed. Thou fool. Anger is always an attack on the brother's life, for it refuses to let him live and aims at his destruction. 
Jesus will not accept the common distinction between righteous indignation and the unjustifiable anger. The disciple must be entirely innocent of anger because anger is an offense against both God and his neighbor. Every idle word which we think so little of betrays our lack of respect for our neighbor and shows that we place ourselves on a pinnacle above him and value our own lives higher than his. Sound familiar, right? The angry word is a blow struck at our brother, a stab in his heart it seeks to hit, to hurt, and to destroy. A deliberate insult is even worse, for we are then openly disgracing our brother in the eyes of the world and causing others to despise him. With our hearts burning with hatred, we seek to annihilate his moral and material existence. We are passing judgment on him, and that is murder. And the murderer will himself be judged. When a man gets angry with his brother and swears at him, when he publicly insults or slanders him, he is guilty of murder and forfeits his relationship to God. He erects a barrier not only between himself and his brother, but also between himself and God. He no longer has access to him. His sacrifice and worship and prayer are not acceptable in his sight. For the Christian, worship cannot be divorced from the service of the brethren as it was with the rabbis. If we despise our brother, our worship is unreal, and it forfeits every divine promise. When we come before God with hearts full of contempt and unreconciled with our neighbors, we are both individual and as a congregation, worshiping an idol. So long as we refuse to love and serve our brother and make him an object of contempt and let him harbor a grudge against me or the congregation, we worship and sacrifice will be unacceptable to God. Not just the fact that I am angry, but, be, but the fact that there is somebody who has been hurt, damaged, and disgraced by me, who has cause against me, erects a barrier between me and God. Let us, therefore, as a church, examine ourselves and see whether we have not often enough wronged our fellow men. Let us see whether we have tried to win popularity by falling in with the world's hatred. So that Christian nationalism there, Trumpism. It's contempt and it's continually for if we do that we are murderers let the fellowship of christ so examine itself today and ask whether at the hour of prayer and worship any accusing voices intervene and make it pray its prayer vain Let the fellowship of Christ examine itself and see whether it has given any token of love of Christ to the victim of the world's contumely and contempt, any token of that love of Christ which seeks to preserve, support, and protect life. Otherwise, however liturgically correct our services are, and however devote our prayer, however brave our testimony, they will profit us nothing. Nay, rather, they must needs testify against us that we have as a church ceased to follow our Lord. God will not be separated from our brother. He wants no honor for himself so long as our brother is dishonored. God is the Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who became the brother of us all. Here in the final reason why God will not be separated from our brother, his only begotten Son bore the shame and insults from his Father's glory, but the Father would not be separated from his Son, nor will he now turn his face from those whose likeness the Son took upon him and those whose sake he bore the shame. The Incarnation is the ultimate reason why the service of God cannot be divorced from the service of man. He who loves God and hates his brother is a liar. There is therefore only one way of following Jesus and worshiping God, and that is to be reconciled with our brethren. If we come to hear the word of God and receive the sacrament without first being reconciled with our neighbors, we shall come to our own damnation. Link is your description, by the way. And of course, when it comes to that damnation, uh, cheap grace is another word for damnation. So forgiveness without rep requiring repentance, baptism without requiring church discipline. And of course, you can't have forgiveness without repentance, and you can't have repentance without atonement. <clears throat> this is why it's always important for accountability. Hatred and anger are both separation from God. Both are sin and lead to so many evils, including demonic suggestion slash temptation, 
diabolical obsession, acts of violence, murder, and worse, as we continually see, especially in fallen Christians during this ongoing pandemic. The opposite of hate, anger, and fear is love. Christ took upon this human form of ours. He became man, even as we are men. In his humanity and his loveliness, we recognize our own form. He has become like man, so that man should be like him. And in the incarnation, the whole human race becomes the dignity of the image of God. Henceforth, any attack on the least of men is an attack on Christ. He took on the form of man, and his own person restored the image of God in all that bears a human form. Through fellowship and communion with the incarnate Lord, we recover our true humanity, and at the same time, we are delivered from the individualism, which is a consequence of sin, and retrieve our solidarity with the whole human race. By being partakers of Christ incarnate, we are partakers of the whole humanity, which he bore. We now know that we have been taken up and born in the humanity of Jesus, and therefore that new nature we now enjoy means we too must bear the sins and sorrows of others. The incarnate Lord makes his followers the brothers of all mankind. The philanthropy of God, Titus 3, 4, revealed the incarnation is the ground of Christian love towards all on earth that bears the name of man. The form of Christ incarnate makes the church into the body of Christ. All the sorrows of mankind fall upon that form, and only through that form can they be born. And that's where teaching Bonhoeffer cost discipleship. And that's his word concerning Imagine this day. So we have to be of love. This is why no matter what, we have to be of love and help others, especially the victims of hatred, the social outcasts, the downtrodden, and anyone in need. To not do otherwise, again, is not of love, for it isn't loving your neighbor, slash brother, sister, fellow human, of whom bears the image of God. A person is defined by their words and their actions, and both carry weight of which many people are ignorant of. For again, our words, actions towards others are going to be used to testify against us and will be the clear indicator that we are Christians, or are not Christians, that we as Christians have ceased to follow our Lord, and again, thanks to hatred slash anger, of which isn't truly repented and intended for, will lead us to our own damnation, most assuredly. I, as a legally ordained reverend, affirm that a racist, xenophobe, Christian nationalism, Trump supporter, or let alone anyone who is used by, consumed by, or consumed by the spirit of anger and the spirit of hate, isn't a Christian, officially or otherwise. I've been given the path of the winnowing church discipline. A part of that path is not only noting the spiritual changes in people and finding out why, but to mark those that are no longer of Christ and to pray for them, pray that God heals them, or pray against that said person so God singles them out and changes them however he sees fit. In this second year being a legally ordained reverend, my consecration slash blessings slash general exorcisms have increased more than I personally admit to. I did have the understanding that exorcism and exorcist perspective would be part of my church discipline path, understanding fallenness, spiritual change in people, and of course having a psychology background, does help with the understanding of the psychological aspect of the understanding of the biological slash mental health of people, and trying to pinpoint the difference in spiritual change and where a course correction slash prayer is needed. When it comes to observing obsession, from a clinical psychological perspective of those who became Trump supporters, then QAnon and our Christian nationalists, the term diabolical obsession is accurate given the results we see. There is a visible text concerning triggers prior to spats of anger in public. We also hear slash see threats of violence, cries for civil war, and of course sweet witness the actual violence as a person's given to the suggestion slash temptation of the spirit of anger and spirit of hate. Christians are called to peace for a reason. Another part of this path I've been given is to warn against very specific things. For outside of the intercession, I can't intervene or interfere in what has to happen concerning other peoples and their consequences of their willful choices. Again, sorry about the background marking. <sighs> Being former medical in the Navy, my desire to help others and save them is paramount to my very being. So I have to watch as the consequences occur and am powerless to do nothing about it for God created the law of consequences to counter the false sin nature that is human nature in which is intrinsically evil. Again, when it comes to the spirituality of a person as well as psychologically, what we consume, read, watch, etc., we become. So those who read, listen, watch, hate mongering, fear mongering, those specific types of spirits do enter them. Our eyes are the windows of, into our souls. 
This is why people change and why enthrallment eventually happened as well as some diabolical obsession. As for another noted change in people, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle penned, if you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however unlikely, must be the truth. The impossible is a Christian cannot sin. The false doctrine of once saved, always saved teaches this and unrepentance incidentally. A Christian can in fact do things that will no longer make them a Christian. Many of these fallen Christians believe they can do all that they wish, full liberty because God gave them free will, and they believe no one has authority over them and that they are the gods of their own lives that can do as they wish as Christians, for because the seed of God is in them and they cannot sin or fall. Again, that belief is equivalent to Satanism, as we've seen, going by the definition of Satanism from an exorcist standpoint. That pride blinds them, and yes, a Christian can do things that will no longer make them a Christian. The four years of Trump and this ongoing pandemic certainly shows who is no longer a Christ that call themselves Christians. The downside is that it is undeniable. When a person slash a Christian mixes the bad with the good, that is still sin slash corruption. Father Gabriel Amaroth puts it succinctly, what is the cause of this moral decline? Principally, it is the diminution of the Christian conscience and the struggles against the powers of darkness. It is St. Paul who warned us, for we are not contending against the flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rules of this present darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Here's how Vatican II frames the situation. When the order of values is jumbled and the bad is mixed with the good, individuals and groups pay heed solely to their own interests and not of those of others. Thus it happens that the world ceases to be a place of true brotherhood. In our day, the magnified power of humanity threatens to destroy the race itself. For a monumental struggle against the powers of darkness pervades the whole history of man, the battle was joined from the very origin of the world and will continue into the last day, as the Lord has attested. See Matthew chapter 4, 24, verse 13, 13. Verses 20 through 30, and verses 36 through 43. Caught in this conflict, man is obligated to wrestle constantly if he is to cling to what is good, nor can he achieve his own integrity without great efforts and the help of God's grace. Link is a description, by the way. So part of this warning I have to do is to educate others properly in church doctrine and correct theology, and to counter the false doctrines and antichrist movements in Christian naturalism. I have to state no uncertain terms that anyone who follows these teachings that run counter against Christ's ten and testaments should be counted as and treated as fallen and be excommunicated and treated as fallen as castaway slash lost slash excommunicated to personally be treated as excommunicated and to pray for as well immediately for their salvation we have a duty to safeguard slash help and serve for again we can fall so easily at any time and we have to help ensure their salvation. We have to hold them legally accountable as they attempt to harm others, slash do harm others. To do otherwise is apathy to evil, so complacency, slash complicity to evil, which God will not hold guiltless. For we also have to con have compassion and forgive others of their wrongs, for God too forgave us as well. Above all, we have to love others, both those around us and those who wish to do us harm, our enemies. God gives us steadfast love and agape, unconditional love, and we, in turn, as Christians, must do this to those around us and those who do us harm. There is an exception to this, period. If we do not do as God commands us, there are innumerable consequences, least of all being becoming beings of hatred and being susceptible to demonic temptation, such suggestion by spirits of fear, spirit of anger, and spirit of hate, and subsequently being used by Lucifer to do unspeakable evils. Again, his very aim is our separation from God, which is ultimately death and spiritual death. So we have to guard our hearts and do all things out of love and fight our human nature daily and do not sin. Sin is defined as harming others. We have to do good, be of love, do good works for God's sake, for our actions and words will be used to testify against us. We are defined by our words and our actions. We shall be judged according to our works. This is why we are exhorted to do good works. The Bible surely knows nothing of those qualms about good works. 
through which we only try to excuse ourselves and justify our evil works. The Bible never draws the antithesis between faith and good works so sharply as to maintain that good works undermine faith. No, it is evil works rather than good works which hinder and destroy faith. So, again, these false doctrines. Evil works. Grace and active obedience are complementary. There is no faith without good works, and there is no good works apart from faith, and that's for Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Cost of Discipleship. A very good read, I highly recommend. So again, our actions and words matter, they carry weight, God is love, and we are therefore also of love to be of God. If we are not of love, we are not of God. Everything we see in fallen Christians these days, especially all that hate, anger, and Christian nationalism, Trumpism, QAnon, again, all that is not of love, for actions and words do define a person, especially if they are, are repeated actions and words that are repented. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Always remember that. So again, be that steadfast love and unconditional love that God is. <clears throat> so, in conclusion, after noting these spiritual changes in Christians who fell and became no longer of Christ, do the opposite of them and their actions especially during the continued pandemic, and value the lives of others around you, being mindful of others, wear a mask if you don't want the vaccination, and put your self-centered desires last. Help those in your community and be of unconditional love. This Valentine's Day and every day for that matter, forgive others, also be mindful of the fact that in your personal life, self-reflection of your past actions, have you harmed someone in any way, words, actions, that you haven't personally asked them to forgive you? A reminder of the fact that this can also lead to fallenness and be counted against you in the Day of Judgment. So we have to seek reconciliation. And to have compassion on others, understand that those Christians who fell from grace, many did so thanks to indoctrination, hate-mongering, fear-mongering, so our responsibility as being of love is to help save them even if they don't believe they need to be returned to salvation, as well as to love a person, even an absolute stranger, of whom is still are your fellow brother slash sister as a fellow human being, quickly, sooner than later, no matter what their life is, and be that positive and loving change you want to see in the world. Change the world as a world changer, with the unconditional and infinite love that Jesus gives, and no matter what you do, do everything out of love. Anyways, everyone, stay safe and God bless.